Welcome to the Shooting the Cue podcast, presented by Heath Riles Barbecue, with tips, tricks, and an inside look with some of the top pit masters in the game. Now here's your host, Heath Riles. Welcome back to Shooting the Cue. Today we're joined, of course, with my lovely wife, Candace. How are you today, hon? I am doing good. And we're joined with our good friend, Jimmy Shotwell from Memphis Barbecue Supply. How are you doing today, Jimmy? Man, I'm doing outstanding, living that barbecue dream. You know... I think me and you both kind of semi got really got going at the same time yep. as far as living that barbecue dream, and it's uh, it's been a wild ride for both of us. <laughs> it has it? been. It has been. I think, I mean, 10 years ago, April this coming year will be our 10-year anniversary. So 10 years ago is when we always really started just getting everything going. Back it up another year or two was like when we were just planning the store and doing all that, and you really transitioned and really got cooking heavy, what, 11, 12 years ago? Yeah. And then you started getting just really heavy on your brand, what, about six years ago and doing that six or seven years ago? And that that's amazing to see you guys grow. Because both of y'all, I mean, you were a nurse, if, you, if I'm yes. not mistaken. You no, went through school. Uh, <laughs> and did. you were right there with him that entire yeah. time. <laughs> but you were also at the contest. You were supporting him. You were supporting her at the same time. And now that you've got this brand, you're not a nurse anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Once a nurse, always a nurse. Yes, that is true. My mother in law is a nurse, so I don't totally understand. But yeah, you're. No, I know what you mean. I don't want to take care of one patient now. We're really two, you know, with me and Colin. That's so. a whiny one right here. That's probably enough having those two patients right there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for everybody that, that does not know Jimmy, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you kind of got into the barbecue world and how you found your way into the barbecue store space. Yeah. So. I grew up in the food industry. When I say grew up in the food industry, my mom owned a bed and breakfast in Middle Tennessee. So I grew up in a bed and breakfast where for about two years there, I didn't know which bedroom I was going to bed at night because she had rented out my room and renovated it and kicked all my stuff to the back. So there were some weekends I was sleeping on the back couch because she had rented out that room. And uh, I grew up in that industry where we cooked breakfast for everybody every single morning. But during this holiday season or the wedding season, it was all hands on deck to... Caesar salad, hey, run, do this. Grunt work is what I did. I didn't get involved in any of the major cooking, but it was all the grunt work and growing up and learning how to do that. I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to the University of Memphis. It uh, wasn't cooking, wasn't anything like that, but it was a leadership scholarship to come to University of Memphis. And once I got here in Memphis, I just didn't turn back. I loved it, found the barbecue community. You got to understand, when I grew up in South Carolina originally before we moved to Middle Tennessee, barbecue was granddaddy's crock pot of pork butt in the crock pot, take a bottle of crafts and pour it in there. It wasn't anything special. It was what we did once a month on a Sunday when we went to his house, but it wasn't life-changing experience. Moved to Middle Tennessee, right there in high school, my mom bought a bed and breakfast. That was kind of the life-opening experience, trying real pulled pork, not shredded, not chopped, not in a crock pot, pork, you know, pulled pork and nice, wonderful, great, great stuff. Then we moved to Memphis, where I got the scholarship. And you want to talk about life altering. <laughs> Be taken to the University of Memphis for that first student tour and then getting taken to the barbecue shop over on Madison, which at that time, not knowing the experience you would have at the, the Rendezvous or any of the other places in town that have traditionally been really good, just blow your mind. I mean, it, it was a life-changing experience. So that kind of got me into the barbecue world. Then I had fraternity brothers who had graduated a little bit further than me who had barbecue teams at Memphis and May. So that segued me into not so much having the barbecue experience, but having the party experience that I got down there for that first year. Hey, come join our team. I was taking the trash out to the curb. I was washing dishes. But at the same time, that second year we did it, their seafood guy didn't show. And they looked at me and said, hey, do you want to do the seafood? I'm like, yeah, I'll be happy to. I didn't get a top three call, but I got a top 15 at Memphis MA the first time ever doing it. And that was just like me fishing and just got hooked right there doing that. And that was 99, 2000, 2001, somewhere in that range. And it was just full-blown have fun at that point. So that's how I kind of got into the barbecue world. Every year was just a step up. Hey, I'm going to do a barbecue contest by myself, a couple of buddies. We moved on. Um it was great. Loved it. Um, then I got a job where I was a district sales manager traveling five states, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Missouri. And I loved the job, not so much for selling the product I was selling, but visiting all these new stops. So Troy, Alabama, 
there's two or three good barbecue restaurants in Troy, Alabama. Or if I go up to Missouri, outside of Whiteman Air Force Base, there's a great Greek restaurant right out the gates that I've never even heard about, family-owned restaurant. So I was finding all these good food spots while I was visiting those Lowe's, those Home Depots, and those independent mom-and-pop hardware stores. Um, and then I started to see in Kansas City and St. Louis stores that were selling specifically just barbecue. I'm not talking an Ace Hardware that had just or any kind of hardware that had a nice grilling section. I'm talking about a store that was a hearth and patio store that had probably about 50 to 60% of their inventory. Barbecue rubs, sauces, more than one kind of charcoal, three or four charcoals, and it had that there. And that kind of opened my eyes. Um, Memphis in May 2012, 2011, I was sitting down with everybody on the barbecue team that we were cooking with, and I looked at them and said, hey, this is my idea. Why don't we have something like this in Memphis? Right now, Memphis, if you want to source anything, it's what Lowe's, Home Depot, the big boxes had. Maybe you can go to an independent, like a Germantown Hardware at that point, which was independently owned. It's not now. And you could get some stuff, but they wouldn't have that selection. You're, there was no Blues Hog. That was the number one request when we started to announce that we we're going to open. Hey, can you get me Blues Hog? Because no one here in the Memphis area had that. So as we started to talk about it, a friend of mine who was a banker looked at me and laughed. A friend of mine who was a lawyer called me 30 days later and said, you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm serious. So we did our due diligence for about a year, really looked into it, margins that we would need, pricing. I mean, all the back of the house. Basics. Stuff. Yeah. And was it doable? Yes, it was doable. I can tell you this now after almost 10 years, it's doable. <laughs> and... It was amazing. The growth we've had, though, for that first year to today, inventory is probably about 50% different. When we started originally, we kind of geared it for competition barbecue teams. Then we also, on the back of our minds, like, oh, yeah, we have the backyard cooks also. Turns out, no, our real business was about 80% of those backyard king, of the, king and queen of the, of the, of the cul-de-sac, and the other 20% was barbecue teams. Yes, we still needed to cater those teams and make sure they got taken care of or their Tokas, or their Arlingtons, or their Memphis and Mays. But Joe, who's in the backyard, and social media at that time was not as big 10 years ago as it is today. They were starting to see the TV shows more than anything. So, Barbecue Pitmaster. Right. You saw Matt Pittman. That's how he got his big start. Barbecue Pitmasters. He started showing off the Meat Church products, and it grew. So, they started asking about that Meat Church. And you started seeing uh, Myron at that time. You... You really couldn't keep the stuff in stock because everybody knew Myron, and they had a yes or no. They loved him or hated him just because of the TV show. Greatest personality, great person in person. The number one question I get with Myron mm -hmm. is, is he really like that in yeah. person as he is on TV? And I'm like, no, he's not no. like that. It's just a character on TV. It, he is a mayor of his town. If he was that kind of character in person, do you <laughs> think the actual people of his city would have met, was it four years Four terms. Yeah, yeah. I think he's been in. This, I think it's his third term. Third maybe. term. Yeah, yeah. But he got reelected recently as mayor of his small town in Georgia, and it's not because he's a celebrity. He knows what he's doing. So yeah, it. it, it that's how we kind of got started. Um, it's been a growth. It's been a challenge. There was a couple of times in that ten years I sat there and scratched my head. It's like, am I doing this? Are we really doing this? The biggest challenge was probably that January prior to COVID hitting. Our lease was up, coming up on April 2020. Talked to a new landlord, because the old landlord who was local had left us. And so we had some guy from West Virginia bought the property. He was like, oh, here's going to be your new rates. There's no negotiation. Here's going to be your new rates. And we went, okay, let's hold it for a second. March hit. COVID hit. Every, shopping, every store in that shopping center we were in shut down. We we're the only ones allowed by the city of Bartlett. At that time, we were city of Bartlett to stay open. We reached out to the landlord again. Hey, dude, everybody's closed. We're the only ones open. Let's negotiate. Nope, nope, here's going to be a new pricing. Okay, fine. Let's do a four-month extension. And then the guy that we're currently leasing from found out we were looking and came to us and said, what can I do to get you in the spot? And it just fell in for a reason. It's those challenges at that point that we were going through that. It's like, I love barbecue. I love cooking, but sometimes the stress. I didn't have all this white hair 10 years ago. I feel you on that one. So, At least yeah. you still got your hair. <laughs> For now. For now, mine's coming.
on is coming. So that kind of is how we got started and what we're looking at now. So, so what's been your biggest hurdle to, to really grow the business at Memphis Barbecue Supply? I mean, like you said, learning, I guess, to switch from comp focus to more backyard focus. Was that kind of – you seen that transition and really just start easing into it more and more and more? I think the biggest is inventory selection and keeping the inventory. When I say in stock, you don't want to sit on dead inventory. It's got to move. And, for example, it doesn't matter whose name is on the bottle. If I have a bottle rub that sits on my shelf for six months, if it doesn't move – when I say move, it doesn't have a 30 or 40% rotation rate, it's going to the clearance table. I give you six to eight months. I basically, I give you a two seasons, usually a spring, a summer, and a portion of the fall, or at this time of year, like you've got new products coming out right now. I have no issue about those. I don't think they're going to have any issue whatsoever. <laughs> I don't think they're going to have any issues but either. I'll put them on the shelf, and that gives you the Christmas holiday. That gives you spring. And then once we get past Memphis in May, Moral Day, 4th of July – I'll sit down, look at numbers, and go, hey, no, these are moving great. Hey, no, they're slow. This is the reason what not. I'm keep yet. these two, move this two, yeah. bring in two more. Yeah. I mean, well, you're always trying to give everybody what they want without carrying 600 rubs. Yeah. And, I th- and let's face it, we do walk in some stores to where you see that inventory sitting there, mm-hmm. and it's like, yeah, well, I know that guy, but it's not turning. And, and it's kind of hard to, it is. To, to, to make that call, but – for a small business, you really have to make that call in order to keep turning the product and your cash flow and, and giving these backyard people what they want. Yeah. It's the biggest challenge, keeping up with the trends is another issue. Yeah. They change day to day, I feel like. Yeah. First trade show <laughs> I went to was Salt Lake City, the Hearth and Patio Show. Mm-hmm. Himalayan salt blocks were the biggest thing. And I I'm remember si- that. And I'm yeah. sitting there 10 years ago, I'm looking at Charcoal Companion, looking at all these other folks pushing these Himalayan salt blocks. I'm sitting there going, why? What is the trend here? What What is the drawback? Why, am I, why are people looking at this? And then we saw two years later, that market just die off. Ceramic grills, about that same time too. Big Green Egg, uh, Primo, all of them were just selling like hotcakes. You could not keep a ceramic grill in stock. Old pellet heads got them, oh, didn't they? And then all of a sudden, that inventory just, and I was sitting at one point, 20K worth of just grills that did not move because that, that entire section of line just died. That was kind of the pellet killed them, but also they killed themselves. Those grills last forever. They're 20, 30 plus a year grills. No grill cycle. So the only reason that person is buying a new grill is if they're going to they upgrade, break they break it, or they move. So that is the sure. thing. It's it's not something that I'm not that's saying. A good, that's a good point. Leaving it there because you don't want to move your green egg or oh, yeah. your primos that's there. You're scared you're going to break it. Oh, yeah. I'll just go ahead and leave it here at this house, and I'm going to buy a new one. You're right. That cycle is not very – if you don't really break those, they last forever. Yeah. yeah. No, nothing to mess up on them. It's like I mean, PK grills. PK grills, they're easy to yeah. move now. Don't give me that. They're not 300 pounds. Yeah. You don't replace that sucker. You'll replace the grates in it. You'll replace maybe a part of hand. A part or, or yeah, something like that. But the body itself is going to last forever. A Weber kettle, typically, until recently, they never had a really good warranty on it. Now they've got a 10 year warranty on the Weber kettles. It's a bumper to bumper, really nice warranty on the gas and charcoal. The kettle's going to last you typically in your backyard, uncovered, no cover on it, use and abuse it what, three to five years before you start having parts rust off of it. If you can maintain it, put a cover on it, clean the ash out of that charcoal, then that's probably going to last you closer to that 10 to 12 year mark. I feel like a lot of people don't do that. No, they don't. I mean, a lot of people do, but... But that's probably one of the most common things is they when they shut that grill that. off, they don't clean it out until they get ready to use it again. Mm-hmm. And let's face it, for the majority of Americans, we know what is the... The grill concentration for households now is at 2%, 3%. I think the Hearth, Hearth and Patio Association, when their last survey they did two years ago, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say it was it was a good percentage. Yeah. yeah. And so those numbers, you still got over 95% of people without a grill in the home today. And just knowing those smaller numbers, out of those smaller numbers, I'm going to say it's probably 95% of the 3 or 4% that does not clean their ashes out of their grill after they get done using it. No. And I am one of the first to admit, I do that several times. I mean, do you? I mean, on your web, do you go back out there and do it a day later? Or Because you're not doing it then when you eat that steak. 
or whatever. It's got to cool down. So you were at my house, I guess, Sunday watching me. I, I don't know because I, I grilled out a steak Sunday night. Grilled it out for the family. Monday, of course, school, getting the kids ready for school and having all that fun. The game plan was go back outside, clean out the ash, clean everything, knock it down to the bucket, and then go dump the bucket later this week. Yeah, this is two days later, and I haven't had a chance to do that yet. It's I mean, life is busy. Yeah, yeah. But the most corrosive thing to a grill is wet charcoal. When charcoal gets wet, it's one of the most corrosive things to it. The porcelain coating on a Weber kettle is great, but if you scratch that and get to the bare metal or the grates in there, it's going to rust up. And then you're going to have to come see me and get me more, get you a replacement grate or a new replacement grill. So, well, know. they do. From what I'm hearing, the data, they say the grill buying cycle is about to happen again in 24 to mm-hmm. 25. Is that the same thing you're hearing? So 2020, everybody was stuck at home. I couldn't keep a grill in stock. Uh, as soon as I would get a shipment of Green Mountain or Traeger or anything like that in, I would either get them assembled or have them right there in the box, and they would go out the door because everybody was at home cooking. That kind of extended into 21. Um, that Christmas season of 2020 was a really big grill season because um, that's what a lot of folks asked for, a grill, because they've been cooking on this cheap grill all year and finally upgrading to get that one. So about three to four years is about where you're shooting for for that grill cycle. So, yeah, I see that happening, but I'm going to put a caveat on that. The quality of your pellet grills have greatly increased. Um, in the past, you typical warranty on a Traeger or Green Mountain was about a three-year warranty. So about after three years, you would see the auger seize up on it or the electronics go out on it, something like that. Now I'm starting to see life expectancy of those grills a little bit longer. I still get customers come in, hey, I need a new igniter rod, or hey, I need a new control board, something like that. But Going five or six years. I'm thinking more like five or six years. So I'm thinking maybe 25, 26 is where we'll see that next big round of whatever hit us. Well, and I feel like some people, even if, say, the grill doesn't go bad or there's not something wrong with it, they excel in cooking and they mm-hmm. think, well, I've mastered this. I'd like to try something new or a new version came out that looks a lot better to me. Yeah. You know, that's what I want. Like I know Traeger is constantly upgrading and I'm sure other brands are as well. So even if something's not wrong with what they have, they might just want something different to yeah. try. And you're seeing here in the last six months and all the way going into next year, what I'm hearing already those innovations are coming. Yeah. Um, Green Mountain's coming out with their new Prime Point Two O. We just saw Traeger upgrade their Ironwood and their right. Timberline lines. Um, interesting one I'm going to be looking at, Rectech. Rectech was always a family-owned company, direct to consumer. Right. They're changing that model because they got more money. Somebody bought into them. Right. Now, just was announced about a week or two ago that somebody found on Ace Hardware's website two of the Rectechs listed. They were at the Ace Hardware show. And from what I'm being told, it was an exclusive Ace Hardware mm-hmm. deal. They're not going to turn it loose to anybody else right now. I'm hearing other. I'm thinking, hearing that, but I'm also hearing those other hardware distributors that may be in the works for them. Ogle, maybe. Maybe in the works. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens because that's always been a direct consumer. Gorilla mm-hmm. Grills is another example of direct consumer. We saw them got bought. They got bought. They're making some changes. And they're making some changes. So it's interesting that. 2019, 2018, those brands were making a name as independent, direct-to-consumer, and now they're changing their models to now to dealers and distributors and moving that product out. More that mass. Yeah, and it's interesting. A lot of these smaller companies are being bought. Komodo Joe was the first one. They were bought by the same companies that own Masterbuilt. That's all family-owned company now. That's Masterbuilt got bought. Masterbuilt got bought, so it's all Charbroil now. So uh, Camp Chef. Camp Chef's got bought. Um, Vista Outdoors bought Camp Chef. Vista, right? Vista Outdoors. So that, and that's they a, also bought Remington Firearms. Mm-hmm. They also, I think, own Smith & Wesson. Mm-hmm. Um, and something else. I believe they're in Missouri. They're, they're like yeah. they're, Their entire umbrella of what they do is outdoor. From furniture to, to, to the lifestyle of outdoor cooking to outdoor hunting. It's that interesting thing. Uh, Pit Boss. Pit Boss is another one we've seen in the last 12 or 18 months that have been bought up by Kalamani. Dansons. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's Louisiana and Pit Boss. It's that entire family group that was a family-owned company, Dan and his sons, Dansons. They got bought up. So it's going to be interesting. We were talking about innovations and what's yeah. coming. 
those are going to settle out. Dust is going to be settling out. I don't see, think we'll see anything this year at the trade shows, but I'm thinking next year is the first year in the spring when we go to our trade shows, be it hearth and patio, the outdoor living, whatever, we'll start seeing that new product because we'll start seeing where they're going to take those brands to. Um, so it's going to be interesting, to say the least. I, I'm looking forward to to this that's going to happen uh, in the next couple of years. Well, I know that you at one time, um, I don't want to skip around here, you have your own line of products at the store as well now, yeah. right? And you eventually got into that, what, a couple of years after the store was open, maybe y'all developed your own line? So we've stuff? always had the Shotwell rub. That was my barbecue recipe rub that we've always had. And people were asking, when I say people, I'm talking personal friends of mine were asking for it. At the wedding, when I got married, we did the little favors as little portions of the barbecue rub for everybody to take home with them. Uh, so that kind of got self just going. And I believe I talked to you, actually. It was like, hey, who's someone who can really co-pack this? I didn't listen to you. I went with another company. <laughs> that tends to happen a lot. To Nobody, that kind of stuff. Well, the volume, originally the guy was sitting there going, was like, it's, I can't do that volume. That's right. Everybody has to graduate up. Yeah. I, I get it. So there's company X that was here that could do smaller volume. But the price per bottle was just ridiculous. Been better off buying that big batch. <laughs> yeah, and just sitting on that inventory. But we created a private label like that. We started with the Shotwell Rub, and then shortly there did a Honey Rub. We did them in bottles, and they moved great. They helped promote the store and the logo and the name. Um, that eventually started adding to that. Some items have hit, some items didn't. But I don't push those like the first thing. How many have you got store. now? Uh, rub wise, we just, we still look at two: the shot wool and the honey. The gladiator, the Trinity was a short run. Uh, gladiator was a, a Greek seasoning, low sodium Greek seasoning. The Trinity was a steak rub, but it was not a salt, pepper, garlic. You had a lot of other stuff in there. Um, but the, the gladiator had no salt, so the bottles were really lightweight. So when you have to do four hundred pounds of inventory, which you thought was like forty four cases, it turns out to be almost 70 to 80 cases because how light that was in there without any salt. So we looked at that, just didn't move well. But we found some other avenues. We've got a company out of Vermont who co-packs just straight spices like garlic, mm. smoked paprika, quality stuff. The price point was great. Found a company down in Russell, Texas who does our canned products. So our pickles or relishes and that. They're not my recipes. But before I bring them and put them on my shelf, I want to try them and make sure they're good. These are the products I don't, when you stop at my store, when you come to my store, I'm not going, hey, no, we grab the shop, I'll grab this. What are you looking for? Oh, I want a sweet rub, okay? You want something sweet, spicy, you want something local, and then we narrow it down from there. And then I don't care whose logo it is or whose brand it is, we'll take you to that shelving unit and go, hey, it's option one, option two, and option three. Uh, this is Heath Sweet, this is... Meat Church's Honey Hog, and this is our honey. And the difference between them is because of X, Y, and Z. And let them make that decision. That's cool. So at one point, you also had a podcast mm -hmm. with Forrest Goodman from the Commercial Appeal. Yep. And it was called The Rub. Yep. And I was on that show uh, a couple times. Couple times. I remember talking. So tell us a little bit about that. I know that Forrest actually passed away. Yep unfortunately, uh, but tell us a little about how that went and all that. Uh, that was, again, a sports and I, good friends. He did the pre- and post-game show for all the University of Memphis sporting events. When I say sporting events, football and basketball, the other sporting events he didn't do. So we both knew each other from football and from basketball, Tiger fans. He loved to cook, so he started coming by the store and grabbing stuff and would sit there and chat. Five minutes to 10 minutes to now 30 minute, 45 minute conversations about barbecue. So he's like, Hey, at that time he was at AM 600. He's like, Hey, um, think about starting a podcast. You want to come join us? I was like, Oh, yeah. Well, he also worked at the Commercial Appeal doing stuff over there. Commercial Appeal actually gave him, like, built him out a facility and did all that to do more podcasts for the newspaper. Um, so, yeah, we started that, called it the rub. I did the talent side. When I say talent, I'm not talent, but I knew the folks in the industry to call, like you and your family or whoever, uh, Kevin down at Memphis MA. I knew who to call, who to, hey, can I get somebody to come on the show to get those folks? Forced through the technical side. He had us up on not just one podcast streaming, but like everything. And this was, again, seven years ago. 
just when podcasts were getting yeah. good. Next thing you know, because Commercial Appeal is owned by USA Today, USA Today National picks up the podcast and starts running on their national podcast like page. Like, you go to USA Today now, don't things like that. They had all their podcasts listed, and we were number one in their food channel, which really blew us away. Uh, had a great time doing it. We won a National Barbecue Association uh, Order of Excellence uh, overall award for that. And Greg Rempe, <laughs> he was actually at the conference in Texas doing the inter- doing the corny interviews in his podcast when we won that year. So um, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I mean, Greg's a great guy. He, he is. is. Uh, but I still never been on the show. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't. I've got to be on his. Uh, I was on his show uh, last week, and uh, with him and Malcolm. And mm-hmm. uh, I mean, Greg's a great guy. Oh yeah. You know, his his segments are live and a little bit different. Mm-hmm. His, you have to come up here at nine thirty at night to to jump online. <laughs> but uh, our time's a little different. Yeah, he's uh, he's a great character. He's got a big following, and it's you yeah. know one of the original barbecue podcasts out there. A lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge there. That was a great thing about doing podcasts. Is Message boards is where the first, like, information exchange of barbecue was out there in the digital world. So, like, the Barbecue Brethren was, like, the first place that really started posting stuff about contests, rubs, sauces, combinations, and all that. It grew from there to starting with podcasts and now videos and social media, and it's kind of expanded from there. So, it's blew up in the yeah. last 10 years yeah. from and, what it was before prior. Oh, yeah. And, and media is always changing. Media is always changing. We thought about bringing the podcast back. Unfortunately, we lost Forrest. And when we lost Forrest, we literally lost all the passwords to all the accounts oh, no. for all the podcasts because he had it all on his company laptop. And shortly after he passed away, they wiped that laptop. And we're like, no, no. And we already wiped it. And... Well, I was like, okay, fine. We start to all back up again, get this going, but I just can never find anybody on the technical side to kind of juggle all that. Yeah. Um, looking about doing some more digital stuff in the future, similar to that. You guys do this, not just podcast, but you record it also. That is where I think it needs to go. When I say think it needs to go, is that interaction. There's platforms out there. Uh, Twitch is a big one. YouTube's another one. Kick is another one also where you can create a community and interact with that community live while you're doing a podcast, while you're um, uh, doing a cooking segment, if you're sitting around having a beverage. Uh, most of those platforms are geared more toward the gamer industry, but I'll challenge you. Go on Twitch right now, look on food and beverage, and there's an entire division on that just of folks in their home kitchens cooking everything from Italian to Asian to Indonesian, every kind of possible, and they've got their own communities. They start building there, and what we've I've always learned from Malcolm, consistency. You consistently put product up there, and those people will come join you week in, week out. And if it's a daily, if it's a weekly, if it's twice a week, just make sure that you're kind of in there. So, so we've yes. been doing research on that, and that's probably where we're going to be going is to pass on more information through the digital aspect of interacting with with our customers with our uh, community base it's definitely the key to success is consistency you feel Mm -hmm. like you're not doing anything on the daily grind to grind you're posting 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 or whatever doing a podcast every week and you feel like it's not getting any traction Mm -hmm. and then when you go back and you look at the numbers and you put it together you can actually just see the slow increase of growth nonstop, and it will eventually get faster and faster and faster but you got to put in the work for it yeah I mean, you'll have some instantaneous ex- explode overnight that you don't expect. And then you have some folks who just uh, go out there and grind day in, day out. And if you stay consistent, <laughs> it's a better chance of you succeeding. I like to tell a lot of people, you ain't going to outwork me. Mm-mm. I done proved that time and time again. You and me both. I mean, you ain't going to outwork me. You can say what you want, but you're not going to outwork me. Well, not only kind of getting away from the digital aspect, but you hold classes at the store as yeah. well. So you, you sell the products and you you hold like informational classes yeah. for people that want to attend as well, right? Pre-COVID, it, we always did free classes. Right. Because at that pre-COVID point, the cost of meat and doing a class, and I'm serving you a meal, I'm serving you samples on that one-hour class, was to get you in the store to get you to look at new products, look at new grills, 
take a look around, learn new, new knowledge, right. but at the same time, look at this new product and maybe buy some of that. So the goal for us was to get you in the store to try new stuff, learn the knowledge, and maybe buy some money, buy some stuff from us. Yeah, That's changed a little bit now. COVID really hit us bad with health, health code restrictions we could have done during 2020 yeah. and 21 that we've had to scale that back. And then the cost of meat and the cost of everything else has gone up that we're starting to have to charge a little bit for classes now. Right. Um, when it's, we'll do some master classes, what I call them master classes, where we'll have some of your caliber come in and we'll charge for that. But if we do just a backyard class now, we'll have to charge $20, $25, $20, just to cover the meat. But again, now we're, we're going to give you more than just a little sample. But right. even if you don't want to come, we if you come in our store by the front door is a wall of nothing but handouts that have all the handouts from all our classes. They're free. Come in there. If you don't see them, we'll give them to you because we want you to know how Thanksgiving, how to smoke a turkey, how to spatchcock a turkey, how to inject, how to brine, what are the purposes of doing that. What does a brine do now with the salt, pepper, garlic rub? How does that interact? So we want you to know that so you can be armed for that knowledge to cook that family meal and be comfortable doing that. Because the next thing is I want you to come back for Christmas and cook that ham or that standing rib roast. And I want to make sure you're comfortable doing that. So that's what we're going to be here for. Well, as you know, like we were just talking about, about those grills and, you know, the percentage of grills that were in households and all that and not being but less than 5% across the United States or whatever. You know, even people coming in your store, uh, they can cook it in the oven using that rub. Yeah. Or whatever. And and I think just people wanting to be different than everybody else and finding out now, well, finding a YouTube channel or a podcast to listen to, and it intrigues them to go buy that rub at the grocery store, at the small mom-and-pop shops. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's why we push our dealer locator so much. I mean, nothing wrong with ordering off the website or Amazon if people want to do that. Yeah. But that mom and pop dealer locator, you know, for people living local to barbecue shops is a great way to find your local shops like you. And I always try to support as much local as I can because they're what thrives and makes the big box what they are, in my opinion. In that local shop, you're going to have somebody who's going to be able to answer your questions one-on-one. I'm looking about bringing on a part-time employee here in the spring. But it cannot be some Joe Blow off the street. It's got to be somebody with knowledge of oh. barbecue. Um, it's hard to find that it, person. Yeah. Who, who has a knowledge of barbecue, who has the time to do it, and has a passion to do it. Because right. there's a lot of folks who know barbecue that don't have the passion to interact with folks and help folks out. They just kind of just, I don't want to call them the folks that go hide in the trailers, but the folks that just show up, hide in the trailers, and leave. You've got those folks who have the passion for barbecue, but unlike you guys who get out there and spread the word, kind of don't do that. I mean, that's just, I think that everybody's a little bit different in personality, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Some people get, uh, I'm not going to say frustrated, uh, are really timid and shy around groups of people and yeah. talking and things like that. And they, and I understand that. I think the people come out of their shell. Some people's like that. Yeah. I mean, my wife's that way. <laughs> it's hard to get her to come out of her shell, honestly. And it's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way some people are. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not, it, it's just a challenge of finding someone who can interact with the public that it's just, I've changed over the years. Prior to me opening the store, I was always the first person at a, a dinner party, whatnot, to come up to folks and talk to folks. I can say it, when I leave the store now, I go home to be with my family. I don't want to deal with anybody sometimes because yeah. I've talked barbecue for 12 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, but I still have a passion that I still take time to come over here and do talk barbecue. That I, that at the Cub Scout meeting next week that we've got to do the annual banquet I'm going to sneak in some barbecue at the potluck, and people are going to ask me about that, but I want to make sure they actually get some good food there. So. Well, that leads me into talking about people and everything else. Memphis in May. Oh, buddy. <laughs> so, as you know, we have had so much, do you want to call it uh, just drama is a better word conflict. going on it's in Memphis? Conflict. Years, it's been years of challenge. When I say challenge. That's a good way of putting it. Back on the Rub Podcast, 2018, 2017, somewhere in that range, we started warning folks and yelling at the top of our lungs on the podcast, MRPP is coming. They want to change the park. It's not going to work. We had Greg Abbott on the podcast. We had, um, I forget his name now. He used to work for Memphis May as uh, 
uh, their media relations. He's now alderman in Bartlett. Um, but or Heath would probably, Heath would know, probably that. know that. But I'm not sure. We had folks from Memphis MA on. We had other folks on talk about it. And 2017, 2018 was when all this information was coming out there. And we're like, guys, this is coming down the pipeline. This is not looking good. And then we've had since then that transition of basically Memphis May being run out of Tom Lee Park. And I don't know how to sugarcoat it in any way. Everybody, you've got two dogs in the backyard who are barking at each other. And you've got the city of Memphis in there between trying to keep them from yelling and barking at each other. And it's at the point that the city just went, okay. Well, it seems like they just cut holes in the fence and then they, yeah. you know, and not mean as in speaking in just terms. Yeah, like no, you said no, yeah. two dogs. It, and looking at the park, anybody that remembers the old park to the new park, you could look at it the first time we went down there to cook in it last year and go, this ain't going to work. When half the sidewalks were not vehicle rated. We're not, I'm going to tell this, sidewalks, which are where you want your vehicles to move onto, were not wide enough or thick enough for vehicles to be going on it, should have been the first red flag. When the sod was laid down, the seed was laid down a month or two prior to the event, and it was so soft, I'm not talking about vehicles or the big tractors getting in there to mess up the grass. You couldn't even walk on it. You couldn't walk on it. If you stepped onto the grass, you sunk in. It was not ready for an event. Ready for an event. And it just boggled my mind. I can see now, I can see this. If, if the event was one more year at Liberty Park, and then they brought them back this year, maybe with the grass growing in a little bit better, they could have worked it a little bit better. It may not have been more damaged, but it it, it was not ready for that event. It well, we also had family friends that worked on an engineering job down there, and that I know for a fact, that some engineering got messed up with MMRP, mm-hmm. uh, that the manhole covers and all had to be raised up three or four foot because every, nothing was not right. And that was after almost the job was completed or halfway during it, and it was a bunch of drama there. This uh, is the same group that put in the restaurant that didn't have a gas line that was right there <laughs> at Bill Street Landing. That when I say there, yeah. I was in the beer there. business then. I fully understand. I've watched and seen three restaurants come and go out of that. And uh, and I'm going to say this. At that point, it wasn't MRPP. It was RDC, River Development Corporation. They did such a bad job and were so over budget, they had to rebrand themselves. Now, to from RDC to MRPP. And so everybody forgets about RDC and all the issues they had at the cobblestones and Bill Street Landing and all that. They rebranded and everything's wonderful. You still got the same leadership there, literally the same leadership who's now not managing that park, but managing all these other parks. But people also don't talk about Mud Island, which is right across the way from there. It's just a ghost town over Yeah. We recently just had the MRPP ask the city of Memphis, hey, we borrowed $3 million from our fund for Mud Island to do whatever. Can we pay that, cover that or whatever? It, it boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. But back to the point of Memphis and May. I think the best analogy I can do to it is the American Roll. The American Roll used to be down at Kemper Arena on the bluffs down below Kansas City in Kansas City, Missouri. American Roll, hey, Kansas City, we need money to upgrade this facility down here and do what you need to. Kansas City, Missouri said, nah, we're, we're good. American Roll went, okay, we're just, we, we can't do it down here. It's not big enough. They moved it to the parking lot of Arrowhead Stadium where the Kansas City Chiefs play at. Massive parking lot. We're out there for two years. It was like a mile for some folks to go turn in their entries, a literal mile to go walk it. And then Kansas City, Kansas, approached the American Roll and went, hey, we've got the infield over here at the Speedway. will not you guys move over here? And it's been there, what, seven years? Mm-hmm. And America, the Kansas City, Missouri, just lost all that income, all that revenue, and moved it over there now to Kansas City, Kansas. And Do they're you building think that's what might happen here in Memphis eventually? The original mission statement for Memphis and May was to basically bring more business downtown, bring it to the city of Memphis. With Jim Holt leaving, it was him, him retiring, you're probably going to see some changeover on the board of directors of Memphis and May. I can see that possibly happening depending on what happens this year and the reception that Memphis and May not gets from the barbecue teams, but from the community itself. 
it's it's definitely going to be interesting. Um, you know, with Jim Holt leaving mm -hmm. the end of January, yeah. and uh, Mac Weaver is taking over as president. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the, the interim. He's currently the CFO for the, the chief financial officer, but he's worked with Jim Holt day to day. On uh, he's been there twenty something years as yeah. well, right? Yeah, and Jim's been saying pre COVID, as soon as I hit sixty five, I'm retiring. He's got. Well, he's been saying that for five years. Yeah. Everybody thought he was joking. And oh. even though everything is going on, Jim is Jim is doing what Jim said he was going to do. And most people at 62 either decide right then, I'm going at 62 or I'm going at 65. Yeah. And Jim's and nothing wrong with that. I think he's got like three kids and seven grandkids or something like that. He's earned it. He's been doing this 20-something years. Memphis yeah. and May nationally has won, I don't know, it's like 30 or 40 Carnival Festival Awards for organizations who do that. So, I mean. Well, what do you think about Ford Momentum having a barbecue contest the same weekend as Memphis in May and all that kind of confusing a lot of the – I mean, it hadn't confused me, but so, you know, I've gotten a hundred phone calls, it seems like, from people asking what I was going to do. And it's hard not to say that I'm going to support Memphis in May at Liberty Park because that's the world championship. That's the qualifier for the Jack Daniels. And American Royal, and those are all major goals of mine. Yeah. And so it would be hard for somebody like me to say, I'm going to go cook another regular barbecue contest just because. Well, well, and you didn't say that contest, if someone doesn't know by now, is at Tom Lee Park, oh, yeah. supposedly. Supposedly. It's going to be Tom Lee Park where they just did $1.4 million damage assessment onto Memphis and May for right. damage there. And you're going to invite that same type of crowd to come down there. Mm -hmm. Two weeks after you do, do the music same thing, fest. basically. Yeah, so it's going to be the exact same thing. It's it's very interesting. I'm, there's a great book out there. Um, former reporter from the Commercial Appeal wrote it. It's called The Politics of Barbecue. It has nothing to do with competition barbecue. It has a politics of Memphis. It's a fiction book. But also barbecue is played into there because it's about trying to bring the Barbecue Hall of Fame to Memphis. But it's the politics of barbecue, but the politics of Memphis. It's pure fiction, by the way. Pure fiction. A uh, former reporter for the Commercial Appeal wrote it, and it's a really good book. And I'm I've never at heard that. of it. Oh yeah, I'll get you a copy. It's called The Politics of Barbecue. It, I haven't heard it's, of it either. It's a really funny fiction book that just focuses on the behind the scenes of the politics of barbecue, the politics of Memphis, by somebody who was a Commercial Appeal reporter who did a lot on the uh, politics of Memphis here in Memphis. So. I'm not saying anything that's true. Well, we know how politics work in small yeah. towns, and we know how they work in big towns, and, and you're either in or you're out. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people's on the take, some people are not. Um, you know, let's just face it, that that is the way the world works these days. Some people don't want to admit it. Some people don't want to say it. I'm not speculating anything about mm, anybody because no. I don't know jack crap about nothing. I'm married to a lawyer, and my business partner's a lawyer, so I, I don't speculate on Anything? I mean, I'm just saying, I don't but know nothing. I know what I'm going to tell you right here about having an event the same week as Memphis in May, a barbecue event, and you're going head-to-head -head with it, Being besides being disrespectful or anything. It's going to be a non-sanction. Well, I say that's not going to be – it's going to be a non-sanction. The big sanctioning bodies have all backed away from them. I know, personally, I've reached out to a couple of board members from both major organizations, and none of them want to have anything to do with it. So it's going to be interesting to see how this is organized as a non-sanctioned event from scratch five months out from doing it. And if you want to be big time, do it. I want to say big time, put on the prize money. Memphis May is 152 k this year, 115 Yeah, I think that's right, around 150, a little over 150000 Yeah, over $150,000 of prize money in Memphis May. And they're saying they're going to come out with more prize money than that. Yeah. It's Tempting if you want to go watch a dumpster fire. When I say tempting <laughs> if you want to go watch a dumpster fire. Well, I mean, if fire, they're writing checks, and I hate it's the same weekend as Memphis and May, or if it's that kind of money and they're guaranteed <laughs> it, I would, you know. I mean, I, I'm going to go cook Memphis and May, yeah. but if it was not the same weekend, I probably would figure out how to cook it. But it's a uh, non-sanctioning body who's doing it. We don't know any details yet of how it's going to do. Are we going to be looking at your typical MBN, Memphis and May, hog, shoulder, ribs? Are we doing more of an organized non meat. For meat, um, their interest website had out there had listed the Memphis May MBN style, but I don't know. 
I'm leery of it. So we know Kerry Bringle was involved. He's come out saying that uh, after much thought and deliberation, he's decided to join the steering committee uh, for yeah. that. We've heard some other people might be on that committee. I don't want to say any names, though, because they, they've not been mentioned online anywhere. It's just phone calls or phone calls. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to say that, uh, other people's names. but I've heard rumors, too, but, again, it's, 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 I'm not confirming. Or, yeah. I really wish we could get somebody on from Ford Momentum or, or somebody. I would just like to ask some questions of kind of what their plan is. I mean, I'm not trying to, to debunk them or dethrone them or anything like that. I wish them the best of luck because with it being Memphis, it you're right, it's kind of a disrespectful thing going up against Memphis in May the same weekend. But Memphis and Maker totally has the room and people and teams to hold another event. Oh, yeah. To tie into a music festival, to make something huge and big. And we all know that there's there's contests like the Q, not contests, but festivals like the Q and the Lou, mm-hmm. the Reno Rib Fest, uh, what, the Chicago Windy City Shootout. Yes. Yeah. And Brian Wagby is doing all those. Uh, we're involved with the Smoking Brothers uh, thing in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Facility. The indoor yep. facility. Indoor yep. facility one yep. in, the, yep. in the winter. And so all those brings on a lot of crowds and a lot of mm-hmm. things like music festivals do. And I think there's a lot of avenues that both Memphis and May and the Memphis Music Fest people could look at of upping their events. And in my opinion, I mean, I like I said, more partial to Memphis and May right now, saying all that. There's world championship and qualifiers for Jack Daniels and all that. But you know, like I know, going to these other events, Memphis and May really could do just a little bit more for the general public and attendees. There's what they can do, like, when we first started doing Memphis and May, they had the people's choice, the little tent you had to send samples on all to. There's so many hoops they had to jump through for the health department here in Shelby County. Now, typically when you have a Why big Why can't event, you get that changed, though, uh, ahead of time? It's that, no it, sense yeah. in saying one roadblock is just a roadblock. Oh, yeah. It's not made to deter you forever. Well, the point is, like, the Q and the Lou and all those that you're talking about, those are great events to interact with the general public. It's not a true barbecue contest per se yeah. it's more of a festival event to get you in there and do it so if you want to change gears and add something on that to it i you've got the space at liberty park to easily do that the problem that you're going to have though you got to make sure you differentiate that kind of festival than from the competition side because then you got the joe blow let me rephrase then you have general public coming up to you and want to try your ribs, even though you may have representatives or ambassadors in the festival side doing that, it kind of. I think you'd have to have it segmented out. Yeah, you would. It's enough zones over there. You could do it. This is a people's choice zone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't really know how it would work. It's a lot of details to work out and make something like that but work, but it, it could be done. It can be done, and things organizations are going to have to involve and change because. Those kind of key MBN noise. is a pure example. Yes. Look at whole hog. When you can't get but five or six whole hogs at a contest mm-hmm. and it's never full like ribs or pork and they finally went all blind and now they've the MBN has really grown when they went all blind. They had a challenger division for a while, but they dropped that. They, they've grown. And, and they incorporated evolved. it and they've grown. Yeah. And now the next phase of challenges to me would be is, I mean, nobody wants to hear this is do away with the whole hog altogether except for three or four contests a year okay. and make it bigger than what it is now. I'm not saying do away with it permanently. I'm saying take your Atoka, your Arlington, your South Haven, and your one more and do a four Pig hog jig. shootout. Pig jig, yeah. A pig jig. Do a four hog shootout and put some big money behind it. Kind of like and every the, team the, would go cook those. Mississippi Delta Challenge. Yes, yes like Kind of like, a like, kind of like the whole hog challenge. That is a great yeah. something like that, Jimmy. And, and the other teams that wouldn't, they concentrate on ribs or pork or whatever, yeah. but change it to pork loin. I mean, it, or maybe, I'm not trying to make it to GBA, but I do think whole hog could be uh, set up on a pedestal somehow and promoted in a different light and in a different form mm-hmm. to make it grow and make it bigger. Your, your MBN is pork. You've got ribs, you've got shoulder, you've got whole hogs. So you need to focus in on still on pork. But I see that, like you said, like doing the Delta challenge, having a pig challenge. Totally yeah. Well, sense. it kind of goes back to what you were saying with the cost of meat as well. Oh. I feel like, I mean, if if you've never cooked a whole hog, for one, it's a lot of work. And there are a lot of barbecue teams out there who are one and two people teams. Mm-hmm. And that's a regular thing. And we've been there, done that 
I mean, <laughs> I've broken down a whole hog by myself. I yeah. don't know how many times. It's a lot of work. But not only is it a lot of work, it, it's a big expense, a very big expense. Not just the meat, but the, the cooker that you need. Yes, the, all the ingredients that you're going to use. All the disposables. I mean, Yes, I mean it's, it's a lot. It's a cost that that builds up. So I mean, and the prize money is only four hundred dollars for first place or at you, some places, and and, and, yes. and at some contests. At some. And that's all you I'm can't saying. Break Those even. smaller contests. What is the point of doing a whole hog where you can't have it four or five teams and you can't you this, though, have the prize money? You've seen this, but you've also won grand champion many a times just with rib. But you tend to have on those kind of NBN events a leg up on somebody cooking whole hog versus a rib because if you've got your hog down pat and you got your showmanship down pat to talk them through that this is the best hog that's just so much impressive of that versus ribs back up to memphis and may statistics shoulders beats everything but let's back up to memphis and may this year we had our first rib champion in, in a while uh, 21 years 21 years um hog and shoulder always gone back and forth against each other they changed up the time schedule where ribs were first and because usually it used to be hog, then shoulder, then ribs. Shoulders stay the same place. They've switched hogs and ribs where hog gets judged last. So that first impression you have on your end of the day judges, that the final judges, the first impression is with ribs. And that's what's just unique this year, seeing John David Willer just, just hit with ribs this year and that's came back and switched that schedule. Well, if I told everybody if I wasn't going to be the one to do it, it wouldn't have better man for it to oh, happen no. to. He deserves it. He doesn't get enough recognition for the barbecue, I want to say lifestyle. I'm talking about the growth of the industry here in the Mid-South. He's one of those characters that never asked for anything yeah. and, never, and never put himself out there like that. With him uh, – becoming partners with Melissa Cookston mm -hmm. and helping and them open a restaurant together. And really, Melissa's the face of the restaurant. Yeah. And, uh, you know, John David's an alderman now for the city of South mm -hmm. Haven, and he still cooks. And he's been with OBR since OBR started. He goes on fundraisers and deployments. He and goes on deployments at a drop he, of the hat. His daughter cooks, does uh, softball, and he's done every mm -hmm. softball fundraiser for 10, 15, 20 years that the children has been in school and his other kids, mm -hmm. he's still doing them. There's one going on right now uh, or just past Thanksgiving anyway, and he's got one for Christmas coming up. And so John Davis, just one of those guys that's always put forth a ton of effort into the barbecue community and not asked for anything back. Well, I feel like he's almost taken like a mentor role. Yes. Uh, anyone who's ever asked for help, whether it's, a softball team or a city or a cooker. wanting to learn how to cook something. Mm -hmm. He never says no. Yeah. You know, he is always available. And so are any of his cookers or anything he has. All you have to do is even know ask John him. David, me calling him going, Hey man, I know I've only met you three times. I really, I got to cook for this job catering job. And I, can I borrow an old hickory pit? Mm -hmm. Come on and get it big boy. <laughs> I mean, never not once thinking about it. Never. I wish nothing. I had known of him when I say no of him been able to call him or whatnot 10 years ago when we started open the store because the knowledge he has just just blows you away when you sit down and have a conversation with him. I've only had privilege of having a couple of those, but uh, uh, I just hands down, it's just like you're talking about mentor. How many folks have you had other in this podcast that one of the folks that got them involved or got them to the next level of the competition barbecue was John David Wheeler? There is no telling. And I'm not talking about the younger kids. I'm talking about think about older. spinoffs off of John David. Yeah, think that's yeah. something you we have kind of talked about. You got Red Hot Smokers that spun off of John David. Mm -hmm. You got Mark West with Ten Bones that mm -hmm. spun off of John David. You got uh, Craig Wilkerson that spun off of John yeah. David. Will be Q. There's are just three stellar teams right yeah. there, and uh, that have created their own legacies. That now you've got spinoffs of some of those teams. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's that 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 it's a huge family yeah. tree that John David is definitely near the root system. Yeah. Or in, when it comes to Memphis barbecue. One thing I do want to go back on to with Memphis and May, you were talking about trying to get somebody. The transparency has been just terrible. Memphis and May is a nonprofit organization. Memphis Fest and the Ford folks look on the paperwork for the state of Tennessee. They're LLCs. They're not nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So they're for-profit events. That is a big thing. It's MRPP is a nonprofit, but you never get to see any of their information. These two are new private entities. I've, that's always been in the back of the mind. 
who's making the money off of this? Where's this going to? You know that old saying, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Follow the money. Follow the money. Follow, Follow the, the money. money. Yeah, and it's uh, uh, Blake. Oh my God, just had the name for the the politics of barbecue. I'll get you that book. It's it's Blake Fontaine. He was a commercial pill writer. Um, he's now in Florida. He left commercial pill to go to Colorado to work for their newspaper down there, but he's in Florida now. Um, he wrote two books, and that was one of the books I really highly suggest. The uh, politics you got me barbecue. interested in that. I've never heard sure. of it. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, I just thank you for coming on today and spilling some knowledge, and it's always good to chat I, with you. I don't, I don't know how much knowledge I gave you. We just – <laughs> well, I hadn't. I don't get to see you as enough as I used to. You yeah. know, back when I first started, you know, and you opened the store ten years ago, I was bringing deliveries to you. Yeah. You know, by the week when you needed stuff, and a big old white truck show up there, and there comes Heath with still a big it. old white yep. truck. It still, in. Yep. You got a two wheeler? I need it. Come yep. on, get it yep. out yep. here. Yep. Yep. I mean, those were the glory days. But you know, that's what it took to build a business, and you know that, and yeah. and it's uh, it's been an incredible journey for all of us, and I hope that none of us are nowhere near done. No, 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 no. I hope not. We've both had great runs, and as long as we all stay healthy and everybody just does what they need to do, we keep grinding. We should be good. That's right. Um, but, yeah, I carry your full line. Was I the first person to carry Heath Riles in the store at, 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 at local, local? I believe so. Yes. It was, yes. 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 So you we, we brought you in, and I carried the full line. We still carry the full line today of everything except for the hot – and the Cajun. And next time you do a video, please let me know so I can stock the Cajun. <laughs> that turkey right there at Thanksgiving that uh, I had so many people ask me for. I'm like, oh, we got the garlic jalapeno, but I don't have the Cajun. So Yeah, the Cajun's definitely that sleeper one for sure. <laughs> it is. Well, look, is uh, tell everybody where they can find you at if they yeah. don't connect with you, Jimmy, and y'all's website and everything like that. Yeah, so Memphis Barbecue Supply, what, 7041 Stage Road in Memphis, right there, right there on the border of Memphis and Bartlett on the west side of Memphis. Uh, website is mbbqsupply.com. You can find us on all the social medias. Uh, just Google Memphis Barbecue Supply, uh, and we'll be right there with you. Well, good deal. Well, thank you for coming on with us today. As always, it's always good to shoot the cue with a friend. Thank you for tuning in to the Shooting the Cue podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media channels or through our website. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. Leave us a review if you enjoyed the show. Until next time, keep shooting the cue.